Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about the controversy of this figure, Paul, who wrote the epistles, or the figure who we call Paul, who wrote the epistles, the letters of Paul that are collected up into the canonical scriptures of the Bible. And a lot of people say, oh, I've heard a lot of people, different people say to me, oh, I hate Paul. Paul is so awful. Paul is like one of the biggest deceivers in the world. He just uh, started off sending everyone down the wrong path and everything went downhill after Paul showed up on the scene. But today I'd like to talk about some arguments from a scholar named Gerald Massey. And I don't always agree with Massey, but Gerald Massey has some extremely intriguing and insightful things to say about this figure called Paul. And I'd like to start off by saying I'm not even sure there is a historical figure who was named Paul. If you look, and this isn't my argument, I think this comes from Alvin Boyd Kuhn, who I'll mention a little bit later. Or maybe it comes from, it may come from Robert Taylor, actually. Paul, in the book of Acts, we find out that his earlier name was Saul, and then it was changed to Paul. And I'm pretty sure it was Robert Taylor, now that I think about it. He points out that Saul is a word for the sun, the sun god or solar, Saul. And then he gets his name changed to Paul, which is suspiciously close to Apollo, another sun god, and there's even controversy over, well, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Was that Paul? For many centuries, they said, oh, it was Paul, and then later they said, no, it was someone named Apollos. So these are probably like the pen names or the cover names of Gnostic writings that are pre-literalist Christianity. So whoever was writing the letters that we attribute to someone named Paul, whose earlier name, according to some legends, was Saul, those are like Gnostic names. Those are like the names of an initiate, uh, an initiate after becoming esoterically informed as to what's really going on. So these letters that we attribute to someone named Paul, Massey treats Paul as a historical figure, and I Obviously, his letters were written by somebody, but I don't even go as far as Massey. And when Massey starts talking about Peter, well, the figure of Peter is a legendary figure, a mythical figure. The whole stories of the Gospels can be shown to be based on the stars, and Peter is a figure who's based on constellations. And I've shown that, and Massey actually argues that way too, but he still sees Peter as an individual person. I'm not sure there ever was any individual named Peter, but setting that aside, let's take a look at some of the arguments that very interesting arguments that Massey makes in some lectures that you can still go read these lectures. They're available in their entirety online. You can read this whole lecture. I'm just going to read some of the most intriguing parts to me where Massey is arguing that Paul was not a proponent of literalist Christianity at all. In fact, he was an enemy, a sworn enemy of literalizing these esoteric teachings. And when Massey says Gnostic, he's talking about esoteric. He's talking about something that has to do with an internal reality and We'll see that in his arguments here. So let's take a look at the arguments of Gerald Massey, who argues that Paul is a Gnostic or esoteric teacher. And I'll just say there are literalist Gnostics who even today will say, oh, no, 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 Gnosticism isn't esoteric at all. It's talking about real literal archons and demiurge and all and all this mythology that they take very literally i would argue that it's all very esoteric but it's teaching truths it's teaching about things that are really going on but i'd be careful about taking it too literally so when 
Gerald Massey says Gnostic. He's talking about esoteric, spiritual, not literal, historical Christ. That's, that's what he's arguing. He's saying that Paul understood Christ as an esoteric and spiritual and internal connection with the divine and not a literal, external, historic Christ. And so when he contrasts Paul as a Gnostic teacher to historic Christianity, what he means is historic Christianity, he's talking about the Christianity that we're familiar with today that teaches a literal and historic Jesus. So Gerald Massey, a very interesting life and a very interesting thinker, a brilliant thinker. He lived from 1828 to 1907. Like I said, I don't agree by any means with everything that he wrote or argued or some of his opinions, but this is a very important argument that he's making about Paul, whoever Paul was, and he's saying some very strong arguments that Paul was teaching the ancient understanding of the ancient wisdom, and then he opposed the literalizing of these teachings. So Gerald Massey lived from 1828 to 1907, and he gave these lectures, some of which have been written down, and the one that we're going to be looking at today is called Paul, the Gnostic Opponent of Peter, Not an Apostle of Historic Christianity. And he's going to argue that Paul has been twisted into a voice for historic literalist Christianity, but that Paul was actually vigorously and vehemently opposed to literalistic historic Christianity that argued for a historic Jesus. He opposed that with every fiber of his being, and he's been twisted into becoming an apostle for historic Christianity when really he was the furthest thing from it. So let's take a look at this lecture. Massey starts off by saying, It has been shown in previous lectures that the matter of our canonical gospels is, to a large extent, mythical. So he's saying that the contents of the gospels, all those stories and figures, mythical. And that the gnosis, this received ancient wisdom, this knowledge coming from ancient Egypt, was carried into other lands by the underground passage of the mysteries to emerge at last as the literalized legend of historic Christianity. Okay, Massey was, I'm going to unpack some of Massey's writings here and we'll skip around a little bit, skip over some of it, but Massey's really an opponent of mysteries. He is a proponent of gnosis, knowledge, and not mysteries where you kind of cover them up and make them mysterious and hide them from people. He wants direct gnosis, and he doesn't like mysteries, but he says that the ancient gnosis or knowledge of Egypt was spread around in the form of mysteries, and it finally popped up later as historic Christianity. It got turned into a literal story that people were supposed to believe in a literal Jesus, whereas really these profound figures are conveying gnosis, pure knowledge that you grasp individually and immediately. And that's what these stories are supposed to be trying to do, but they've been twisted into something different through this process of mysteries. That's Massey's argument. So skipping down, he's going to say that Paul, if you start reading the letters that are attributed to Paul, you're going to hear two voices in there. And that's because there was a real Paul who understood the gnosis, and then later these literalizers who are pushing a historical Jesus are going to come in and twist and forge 
and make an imposture of Paul and mix that in there. So there's two voices. So he says, it's likewise more or less apprehended, if you start reading it yourself, you'll grasp it, that two voices are heard contending in Paul's epistles, his letters. An epistle is a letter. So in Paul's letters, you're going to hear two voices, and that's because someone later came in and started messing with what the original letters contained. To the confounding of the writer, the original Paul, or whoever it was, the original writer's sense in the confusion of the readers. So not only does he mess with what the original writer was trying to say, this, this imposture that came in later, it also makes it hard for the reader to figure out what is Paul talking about because there's two voices. They utter different doctrines, so fundamentally opposed as to be forever irreconcilable. And this duplicity of doctrine makes Paul, who is the one distinct and single-minded personality of the so-called quote-unquote New Testament, look like the most double-faced of men, double-tongued as the serpent. The two doctrines are those of the Gnostic, or spiritual Christ, not a literal physical Christ, but a Gnostic spiritual Christ, that's the one voice, and the historic Jesus, that's the other voice who's arguing for a literal physical historical Jesus. So we've got a Gnostic voice and then a literalistic voice. Both cannot be true to Paul, and my contention is that both voices did not proceed from him personally. He wasn't sitting there writing with two completely different doctrines. He was writing the Gnostic doctrine and then the literalizers, the proponents of a historical, literal, earthly, physical Jesus came in and added the other voice that you hear. We know that Paul and the other apostles did not preach the same gospel. And it is my present purpose. So here's Massey's thesis. He's going to show that Paul was teaching something different than the apostles of historic Christianity, the, the proponents of the literal, physical, historical Jesus and the doctrines that have come down to us as Christianity. So Paul on one side and then the historic apostles preaching a historic Jesus on the other side. So we know that Paul and the other apostles did not preach the same gospel, and it's my present purpose to show that they did not set forth or celebrate the same Christ. My thesis is that Paul was not a supporter of the system known as historical Christianity, which was founded on a belief in the Christ carnalized, in other words, made flesh, carnal, an assumption that the Christ had been made flesh. But that he was its unceasing and deadly opponent during his lifetime. He's the opponent of carnal Christs, a, a fleshly Jesus. He is talking about a spiritual inner Christ, an inner divine. That's what Paul is talking about. And these other proponents of historical fleshly Jesus in flesh and blood are the impostures, and Paul was their deadly opponent. That's what Massey is going to argue here. So he was its unceasing and deadly opponent during his lifetime, and that after his death, his writings were tampered with. Paul's writings were tampered with, interpolated, and re-indoctrinated. New doctrines were slipped in there by his old enemies, the forgers and falsifiers, who first began to weave the web of the papacy in Rome. So the papacy, of course, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. And there were different bishops in different cities. There was the Bishop of Alexandria. There were different bishops throughout the Roman Empire at the time that this struggle was going on. And the papacy is the argument that the Bishop of Rome is the head of all the other bishops, and that, of course, went into the creation of Roman Catholicism, the Pope or the Bishop of Rome being 
the head of all the others. And that led to later splits and schisms. But when he talks about Roman Christianity, he's talking about the literalist Christianity that holds that the Bishop of Rome is the head of the church. So that's what he's talking about. So those forgers and falsifiers who are preaching a literal Christ, Massey is arguing Paul was dead set against that. Now notice that the Bishop of Rome is claiming descent from Peter. So throughout this argument, Massey is going to be contrasting Paul with Peter. So when you see Peter, like I said at the beginning, I don't believe there's a literal historical figure named Peter. Peter is a figure in the Gospels. The Gospels are all based on the stars. Massey at the very beginning says, hey, the Gospels are myth. And he has various arguments for that. I show it even more conclusively by connecting to the stars. And Robert Taylor, who I mentioned earlier, he also was showing that the gospel figures and stories are based on the stars. Robert Taylor and I came to some different conclusions, but I definitely agree with Robert Taylor's arguments about connections between the figures in the gospels and the constellations. Robert Taylor was very insightful about that. So Massey makes his own arguments, I don't always agree with Massey's arguments, but the gospel figures are mythical, just as Massey asserts in the very first sentence that we looked at. So Massey says, look, the gospels are mythical, but then he proceeds to talk about Peter as if he's a historical figure. But you can just basically substitute the teachings of the literalist bishops, and in particular, the Bishop of Rome and then the Roman Catholic Church, whenever Massey says Peter, because the Bishop of Rome supposedly got the authority, the keys, directly from St. Peter. Okay, so whenever he says Peter, just think of literalist historical Christianity. And Paul as opposed to that. That's what Massey's going to argue. Paul was a deadly enemy of literalizing. In this way, there was added a fourth pillar or cornerstone to the original three in Jerusalem. I'm not going to get into that, what he's talking about. He's just saying that you've got basically the, the historic apostles of Peter, uh, James, and John, and then you've got Paul over here, and they try and bring them all together as if they all support historical Christianity, and Massey's going to say, no, Paul was totally <laughs> separate. They're just trying to co-opt him into supporting their literalist church. So that's what he's saying. I'm just going to skip over that. The supreme feat performed in secret by the managers of the mysteries in Rome, remember Massey doesn't like mysteries, he likes gnosis, was this conversion of the epistles of Paul into the main support of historic Christianity, exclamation point. He's saying, what a magic trick. They took the writings of their bitterest enemy and converted them through a sleight of hand into supposed support for their literalist historical project. It was the very pivot on which the total imposture turned. He's saying these literalizers are imposters. They're taking the Gnostic, spiritual, esoteric understanding of Paul and turning it on its head and flipping it around to say that it all supports their interpretation, which Massey says is a misinterpretation and he argues that Paul also saw them as a misinterpretation, taking it the, totally the wrong way, turning it on its head. In his lifetime, he, Paul, had fought tooth and nail with tongue and pen against the men who founded the faith of the Christ-made flesh and damned eternally all disbelievers. So 
Paul fought against the men who argued Christ made flesh and who also argued the people that Paul are, Paul opposed the people who said anyone who doesn't believe in Christ made flesh is damned is going to hell. So Massey here is saying the literalizers not only teach Christ made flesh but they also teach and if you don't believe in a fleshly Christ you're going to hell. And Paul opposed both of those things. He fought it tooth and nail with tongue in his preaching and with pen in his letters. And after his death, after Paul's death, they, Paul's opponents, reared the church of the sarcolatry above his tomb. Okay, so the reason I'm kind of unpacking this is Massey is pretty poetic, and he kind of just throws all this stuff at you. What he's saying is that after Paul died and was buried, his enemies built their church right on top of Paul's tomb, and Massey calls it a sarcolatry. Sarco means body, flesh, like a sarcophagus. A sarcophagus is a, a mummy case of ancient Egypt. Sarco means body and phagus, like esophagus, um, means to devour. So sarcophagus is a body devourer or a body eater, but it's a, it's a term for a mummy case. Sarcolatry is a body or a flesh idolatry, a, a, a worshiping of a fleshly Jesus. So Massey comes up with this word sarcolatry, just throws it in there as if you're supposed to understand exactly what he's saying. And he says, Paul's enemies built their sarcolatry church, worshiping a fleshly Jesus, right on top of Paul's grave. Once Paul was gone, they just proceeded to build their church right on top of him and in fact co-opt his writings. That's what they're saying. When, when Massey's saying they built on top of him, they stole his stuff and used it to build their church right above his tr tomb. And for 18 centuries have, with a forged warrant, with fake papers, claimed him as being the first and foremost among the founders. So they built this church that he would have opposed, and using forged papers, a forged warrant, they called him one of the fathers of their church. They, they co-opted him as being their first and foremost founder. They cleverly damned the course of the natural river that flowed forth from its own independent source in the epistles of Paul. They, they took the river coming out of Paul's letters, they dammed it, they built a dam, and turned its waters into their own artificial canal so that Paul's living force should be made to float the bark, that's the boat, of Peter. And like I said, when they say Peter in these lectures, when Massey says Peter, just imagine the literalistic church. So another you know, beautiful poetic metaphor coming out of Massey. He says, <laughs> he's just throwing metaphor after metaphor. After they built the church and co-opted him as its founder, they, the other way to look at it is they damned the beautiful river of living water coming out of his letters that's teaching you about the real Christ within, the spiritual Christ, and they turned it into their artificial canal and put their boat right on top of Paul's teachings after they turned it into a dead end. Nevertheless, those who care to look closely will see that the two waters, like those of the River Rhone, will not mingle in one color. And it appears to me that whether Paul was mad or not in this life, such nefarious treatment of his writings was bad enough to drive him frantic in the next and make him insane there until the wrong is righted. So Massey's saying, Paul must be turning over in his grave until somebody digs out the 
injustice that was done and fixes it. And Massey's going to try and do that with this lecture here about Paul being the Gnostic opponent of everything that Peter is supposed to stand for, literalistic, historic Christianity, worshiping a fleshly, physical Christ rather than an internal, spiritual, Gnostic Christ. It is the universal assumption that Paul, the prosecutor of the early Christians, was converted by a vision of the risen Jesus. Okay, I'm going to skip over some of this, but he's talking about when Paul is describing his own conversion to the Galatians, he describes as it in he dis, Paul describes it in his own letters as an internal spiritual revelation. And he says a little bit further down, he received his commission to preach the Christ as he declares when it was the good pleasure of God to reveal his son in me. It wasn't by an apparition of a historical Jesus of Nazareth. And then Massey says, Paul makes no mention of a Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, Jesus of Nazareth is unknown to Paul. His name never once appears in the epistles. And the significance of the fact is in favor of the present view. And the significance of the fact in favor of the present view can hardly be exaggerated. So Jesus of Nazareth does not appear in the Gospel of Marcion or as it was represented by some of the Christian fathers, Marcion had removed the name of Jesus of Nazareth from his particular gospel, being so virulent a heretic. Okay, what's going on here? There's a early Gnostic named Marcion, a very important thinker, first century, who doesn't talk about Jesus of Nazareth, but does mention Paul. And so Massey says, look at Marcion. Marcion was a Gnostic. Marcion was anathematized by the literalistic church. They called Marcion a heretic, and they said he will be going to hell. He's, he's teaching heresy. And Marcion agreed with the letters of Paul, or at least some of them, the ones that he didn't think were forgeries. Marcion said, these are the letters that should be included in the canon of what people read. Marcion agreed with about 10 of the letters of Paul. So Massey is saying, look, if Marcion rejected the human nature of the Christ, Marcion did not believe in a literal, physical Jesus. He believed in a Gnostic, spiritual Jesus. If Marcion rejected a literal Christ, but Marcion accepted Paul, then that shows that Paul was a Gnostic. So this is an argument. We'll just, um, we'll just finish off by pointing out that's what, that's what Massey is arguing here. He says, Marcion, the man who knew, recognized his fellow Gnostic in Paul, but rejected the literalizations and the spurious doctrines which had been surreptitiously interpolated by the founders who were the forgers of historic Christianity. So the founders of historic Christianity forged some letters of Paul. Marcion rejected those, but Marcion did recognize in some of the letters a Gnostic Paul. That's the argument that Massey's making here. So I'm just going to continue on. So, continuing on with Massey's lecture and skipping down a little ways, in Paul's own account of his conversion, he continues, Immediately I conferred not with the flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia. So, Massey is here quoting from Paul's account in the letter to the Galatians, or whoever wrote this letter to the Galatians. Like I said, Paul may be a pen name of 
like Apollo, it, it's related to that. But in the letter to the Galatians in chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, we find the passage that Massey's re, uh, referring to here. Paul says, or the letter to the Galatians says in chapter 1, verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Paul being from uh, Syria, the region today is, is called Syria. So Massey says this is significant. He didn't seek to know anything about the personal Jesus of Nazareth, about his life, about his miracles, about his crucifixion, about his resurrection and ascension. Supposedly, if Jesus appeared to Paul, the Jesus that's being taught by the literalizers, then Paul might want to know, oh, tell me more about this, this person who appeared to me, this Jesus. Tell me, you know, about his crucifixion. Tell me about his resurrection. Let me go find the people who knew him and learn about his life. No, according to Massey, this is very significant. Paul, when he had this spiritual revelation, goes off into the desert. He had no anxiety to hear anything whatever from, quote, living witnesses or relatives about the human nature of this divine being who's supposed to have appeared to Paul in person, who's supposed to have completely changed the current of Paul's life and transformed his character. No wish to even verify the historic or possible groundwork for the reality of his alleged vision of Jesus. Maybe you might want to go, like, check out, is, did this person really... You know, does anybody know this person who appeared to me? No, he doesn't do any of those things. So Massey says, this is very revealing. When he did go to Jerusalem three years afterwards, and again in 14 years, he positively learned nothing whatever from those who ought to have been able to teach him and tell him all things on matters of vital importance for historic Christianity. In other words, vitally important things. If he believed in historic Christianity, he might have wanted to learn from the people that he met in Jerusalem, like Peter, if there was such a person as Peter, about which he should have been most desirous to know, but by his own admission had no manifest desire of knowing. He saw James, Peter, and John, who were the pillars of the church and persons of repute, but whatever they were, it made no matter to him, they imparted nothing to him. He says these respectable persons, these pillars, who seem to be somewhat, at least they seem to be pillars, communicated nothing to him. Contrarywise, it was he, Paul, who had a gospel of his own, which he had received from no man, to communicate to them. Paul says, I didn't get it from flesh and blood. I got it from spirit. This is a spiritual gospel, and so... Massey is saying, look, if you read Galatians, you can see the author is talking about something very different. He's saying, I got this from no man, and when I got it, I didn't go running to human teachers. I went out to the desert. Very revealing. Okay, so we'll, we'll skip down. There was a compromise. Okay, so he, he argues that Paul, when he found those who were teaching historical Christianity, the historical teacher said, hey, Paul, shut up about that. You go teach it to the Gentiles. Leave us alone. And they, they came up with a deal, a compromise. Now, Paul was uncompromising, but they said, look, we'll, <laughs> we'll leave you alone as long as you just go teach you know, far away from here to the Gentiles. <laughs> Massey says, you can go to the Gentiles or go to the devil. We don't care. They just wanted to get rid of them. And so 
Paul says in his letters, they were teaching another gospel. What was the gospel? Massey says, we know what their gospel was because it has come down to us in the doctrines and dogmas of historic Christianity. It was the gospel of the literalizers of mythology. The people who take profound myth that's there to teach you esoteric truth and literalize it and therefore make it into something totally different, that is turns it on its head. It was the gospel of the literalizers of mythology. That's the other gospel. The gospel of the Christ made flesh to save mankind from an impossible fall. The gospel of salvation by the atoning blood of Christ. The gospel that would make a hell of this life. He's talking about historic literal Christianity that believes in a literal physical Jesus who had to physically die and physically atone with physical blood. This is Massey criticizing literalist Christianity and saying Paul is criticizing it and calling it another gospel. It's a completely different set of teachings, a different set of so-called good news. I'm teaching you something spiritual. They're teaching you something totally different, fleshly, historical, about a historical Jesus. I'm not teaching that. I'm teaching about a spiritual Christ, a spiritual divine that you can find within yourself. That's the argument that Massey's making. The gospel that would make a hell of this life on purpose to win heaven hereafter. So Paul, say, Paul and Massey saying, Paul's not talking about something that's for the afterlife. Paul's talking about something for right now. But the literalizers are saying, oh, this is all for something that happens after you die or you go to hell if you don't believe in literalism. These are the teachers of the gospel of flesh and physics, including the corporeal resurrection, the bodily resurrection. They're teaching a bodily Jesus. Paul was dead set against that. So it's a <laughs> Massey's not pulling any punches. He's saying this was a this was a irreconcilable difference, and it still is today. So continuing on to the finish of this sentence that Massey is saying here. These teachers are teaching the corporeal resurrection and the immediate ending of the world. The world's going to end pretty soon. They're also teaching that. The gospel that has no other world except at the end of this. Theirs was that other gospel with its doctrines of delusion against which Paul waged continual warfare for Another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel were being preached by these preeminent apostles or teachers of literalism who were the opponents of Paul. I don't believe that these apostles were running around with a physical, literal Jesus because I believe all those stories are just like the stories of the Old Testament, and just like the myths of cultures around the world, those are all based on this celestial metaphorical system and can be shown to be. So I don't think Massey really thinks that those apostles were talking with a historical Christ either, but he talks as though they were. So it's a little confusing. I think we might as well just think of the literalists, the teachers, the establishers of the literalist church, whoever they were and whatever names they gave themselves, Paul was against those guys. Okay. Those preeminent apostles, Paul in his letters calls false prophets, deceitful workers, and ministers of Satan who came among them to preach another Jesus whom he did not preach in a different gospel from that which they had received from him, from Paul. So when he's talking in these letters, he's saying, watch out for these so-called apostles coming around and teaching something different from what I taught you, teaching about a fleshly Jesus. Okay. 
To the Galatians he says, If any man preacheth unto you any gospel other than that which ye received, i.e. what I told you, let him be damned or let him be anathema. He chides them, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye perfected in the flesh? <laughs> you started off hearing from me about a spiritual Christ. Are you now, you're moving on to the next level and going to a flesh Christ? That is, and then Massey explains what I just explained. Are you believing in the gospel of the Christ made flesh, the gospel to those who were an enemy of Paul, who followed on his track like Satan, sowing tares by night to choke the seed of the spiritual gospel, which Paul had so painfully sown? So Paul's going around teaching a spiritual gospel, and right behind him are coming the teachers of, oh no, you have to believe in a physical Jesus or you're going to go to hell. And by the way, the world's going to physically end pretty soon. We still have that teaching going on. Okay. So, continuing this sentence, not only are they following on his track, sowing tares by night to choke the seed of the spiritual gospel, which Paul had so painfully sown, but also who, as he intimates to the Thessalonians, so as Paul hints to the Thessalonians, these false teachers were quite capable of forging epistles in his name to deceive his, Paul's, followers. So we'll see that in, in a little bit, where Paul says to the Thessalonians, they'll even forge letters as if they're from me. Watch out. And that's exactly what Massey says happened. Okay. So why did Paul say that? Because Paul's already probably guessing that these teachers of something completely different are going to be faking letters written by Paul. So Massey's going to say, look, I am the first one to really show you this divide. He says, it has never yet been shown how fundamental was this feud between Paul and the forgers of the fleshly faith because the real facts had not been grappled with or grasped concerning the totally different bases of belief in the forever irreconcilable gospels of the Gnostic or spiritual Christ and of the Christ made flesh to be set forth as the savior of mankind according to historic Christianity. Nobody else has grasped what a huge and irreconcilable difference we have going on between what Paul is teaching and what these literalists, whom he kind of lumps under the name of Peter, are teaching. They can't be, it's a gulf, it's a chasm, it's a canyon that no one can bring together. He says, it was impossible that Paul and Peter should draw or pull together. The different gospels of their faith we're in the beginning from pole to pole apart. They're as far apart as the North Pole and the South Pole. He says, Paul says, I made known to you, brethren, as touching the gospel which was preached by me, that it is not after man. For neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, save through the revelation of the Christ revealed within. He did not derive his facts from history, nor his gospel from the apostles. He was neither taught by man nor book. He derived his gospel from direct personal revelation of the Christ within. In short, his Christ was not that Jesus of Nazareth, whom he never mentions, and whom the others preached. Okay. Massey is setting up how big of an argument he has to make. Now let's see some of his evidence. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. You can read the whole thing for yourself. I don't agree with all of Massey's arguments, but this is a very powerful argument that he's making. I do agree with the general thesis that Paul was teaching something completely different from this literalist Christianity, and then the forgers came in, 
and inserted another voice into some of his letters and forged some letters to make it sound like Paul was on their side when Paul was actually a total opponent to literalism. So I do agree with that. Let's see a few of Massey's arguments. Okay, now he's going to the second epistle of Peter, Second Peter. Like I said, did Peter from the Gospels write this? No, but literalists did. In the second epistle of Peter, we find the writer, whoever it was, mentions Paul by name and replies to his epistles. He is covertly trying to counteract the influence of, he's, he's kind of undercover trying to counteract Paul's teaching. To counteract the influence of Paul's teaching on a matter of such importance as the second coming of Christ and the immediate ending of the world. In the first chapter, he proclaims that the end of all things is at hand. Here he says that mockers are asking, where is the promise of his coming? They forget the cataclysms and deluges by which the previous heavens and earth have perished. perished. This time the end will come with a universal conflagration, and according to promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth. Our beloved brother Paul has been speaking of these things. According to the wisdom given him, he wrote unto you, as also in his epistles, speaking in them in these things, wherein are some things hard to understand, which the ignorant and unsteadfast rest, twist, or as also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Okay, so Massey says, the subject matter here is the nature of the time cycles, the mythical destruction by flood and fire, which as an adept, Paul knew to be typical and allegorical. So the end of an age, the end of a world, those are celestial, those are processional, those aren't physical. So Paul knew that, and Peter, or the writer of the Second Peter is treating them as if they're literal and saying, well, Paul, you know, the things he was saying, some people are trying to twist what he's saying out of context, or really the author of Second Peter is twisting Paul out of context. That's what Massey is arguing here. Being an outsider, the author of Second Peter, Massey's talking about, he did not understand the wisdom of no, or gnosis of Paul, but says it is misleading, inasmuch as the ignorant rest it unto their own destruction, twist it. Peter's trying to say that Paul's gnosis is not really teaching gnosis, but only ignorant people are trying to twist it to say that. Peter had also said that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. To this we have direct replies from Paul, Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that aught be written unto you. For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. For ye are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, as were those foolish physicalists, the Petrine, as, as in Peter following, agnostics, agnostics, anti-gnostics. And again, he says to the Thessalonians, now this is a passage from 2 Thessalonians, Now we beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that ye be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet be troubled either by spirit or by word or by epistle, as from us, as that day of the Lord is present at hand. In other words, don't be tricked by some so-called apostle or even by a supposed letter from me saying that the end of the world is really near. Because Paul is saying that's literalistic thinking. Don't take celestial esoteric gnosis as literalistic, historical end of the world. Totally out of context. That's what Massey is arguing, and I agree with him. 
Let no man beguile you in any wise. And then Massey says, Give no heed to that ignoramus's gabamushery. Okay. Then follows a break in the sense. So he's saying maybe some interpolation went on in between here. But then you get Paul saying, First, the man of sin must be exposed, the son of perdition, he that opposeth and exalteth himself against all that is called God. Everything that has to do with the spiritual divine revelation that Paul is talking about is opposed by this man of sin. All that is worshipped so that he sitteth in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. That, I say, is St. Paul's opposer, Peter, who was set up in the church of Rome. So, Massey is making a startling assertion here. He's saying that the next thing that you hear Paul, the real Paul saying is, watch out for the one who opposes the true divine, and that is this literalizer who's going to set himself up as the voice of God himself, that is, the bishop of Rome who claims to have authority directly from Peter and thus directly from a historical Jesus, who tells you that if you don't believe in a historical Jesus, and indeed that if you don't come under the authority of that bishop of Rome, then you will go to hell. And Paul is saying, watch out for that. That is the enemy. That is the man of sin. So Massey is talking about this passage here in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2. And it's basically what you just saw Massey quote. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed. So don't worry about the end of the world. What you have to worry about is this man of sin who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You have to watch out for the one who claims to speak as God himself and who sits himself in the seat as if he's God himself. And remember, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So Massey is making an argument that Paul is actually referring to the Bishop of Rome, or Peter, in this case, the literalizers who claim to have authority from Peter. Massey says, I know there's a bold claim. No one has ever dared to dream that this man of sin, being referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2, is Peter himself, or the literalistic church claiming a literalist Jesus, and if you don't believe in the literalist Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And if you don't follow the literalist bishop that claims to have authority from Peter, you're going to go to hell. No one has ever dared to dream that this man of sin is Peter himself. But the person aimed at is considered capable of forging epistles in the name of Paul, this attributing this kind of teaching to him and making him father it whilst Paul was yet living. This man of sin and son of perdition has set himself up in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. And the hinting that he might even make letters as if they come from Paul is right there in verse 2. 2 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2 nor by word, nor by letter as from us. So watch out, these deceivers, these literalizers, 
might even bring you a letter that is forged and claims to be written by me, but it's not. So Peter, the lifelong enemy of Paul, is the one that is being described according to Massey's analysis of 2 Thessalonians. Paul was basically a deadly enemy of the literalizers, and he says, watch out, my enemies will even forge letters in my name. And what he's talking about is the literalizers who we can just group under the name of Peter. That's the way Massey has decided to refer to them. Peter, the lifelong enemy of Paul. I don't know if Massey really was thinking of a literal Peter when he just started off the thing saying that was all myth. Maybe he did. If so, I disagree with him. But anyway, I'll take it to mean the literalist teachers setting themselves up in the seat of Peter. This lifelong enemy of Paul, that's who he's talking about as this man of sin in 2 Thessalonians, according to Massey. He who's preaching is concerning signs and lying wonders, such as those stories about the end of the world. This Peter, this writer of 2 Peter, the passing away of the heavens with a great noise, the dissolution of the elements with fervent heat and the burning up of the earth with all the works therein and other teachings of his, of this cataclysmalist, which Paul denounces as delusive and knows to be a lie. This misleader of men is restrained for the time being by Paul himself. This is Massey's interpretation of what Paul is actually saying in 2 Thessalonians. Massey says, look at what Paul's saying. He's saying, who's holding back the man of sin? Who's holding back the literalizers? Me, Paul. But as soon as I'm out of the way, but when he departs, when Paul departs, when Paul is dead, Peter, or the literalizers, will reveal himself or be revealed in his true colors. And the Thessalonians will then see what Paul has known all along and against which he had warned them once before. So once Paul is dead, Paul is saying, look, I'm holding back these literalizers, but once I'm gone, you'll see their true colors, and then maybe you'll remember that I was warning you about them. I hope you will. I.e., against that working of error and belief in a lie, which we now know by the name as historic Christianity. So Paul is holding back the lie of literalism. That's what Massey is reading in explaining to us here. It is here then that we can peer right down into the deep dark gulf that divided Peter from Paul. When, when you see this, you can see that the, there's like a bottomless canyon between what Paul is teaching and what these literalizers that will just lump under the name Peter is teaching, are teaching. Paul is teaching, Peter is teaching, and there's a bottomless gulf. There's a canyon that's like a bottomless pit. When you, when you look down into it, you see they are so far apart, there's no putting them together. So this part here, we get a lightning glimpse in the Clementine homilies. Massey's going to go into some examination of these homilies that were supposedly written by Clement of Rome. Um, Clement, the Clementine homilies, they're now believed to have been written by someone much later than Clement, but they call him pseudo-Clement today. But anyway, in those, those are literalists, and they're basically attacking Paul's doctrine. Uh, according to Massey, they say things like, well, who can get there, who can become an apostle just by claiming that they heard the voice of spirit, which is exactly what we saw Paul saying in the Galatians. So these are like anti-Galatians teaching in the Clementine homilies. So we can see that the literalists hate Paul. So Massey's going to go into an examination of some of the evidence in the Clementine homilies. I'm not going to get into that right now. But, so, I'm getting towards the end here, but 
Massey's going to put forth the, the thesis here. The problem of the plotters and forgers in Rome was how to convert the mythical Christology into historic Christianity, i.e., turn Paul's spiritual teachings into a support of their literalistic teaching of a historic Jesus. And when Paul's epistles were permitted to emerge from obscurity in a collection, what had occurred was the restoration of the carnalized Christ, that other Jesus who was repudiated by Paul in his own lifetime. So when they finally brought the letters of Paul out and they interspersed some of their own teachings in there and some of their forgeries, they turned them into a support for a carnal or physical Christ as opposed to a spiritual. Paul felt or feared and foretold that this would be the case when once he was removed out of the way. He saw the mystery of lawlessness already at work, the falsifier sending forth letters as if from himself, and we have seen what Paul foresaw. The problem of the plotters who forged the foundations of the church in Rome was how to successfully blend the Christ of the Gnostics and the pre-Christian Apocrypha and of Philo and of Paul with that corporeal Christ and impossible personality in whom they ignorantly believed through a blind literalization of mythology so as to make the historic look like the true starting point and make the Gnostic interpretation become a later heresy. Okay, another huge mouthful from Massey, but we're taught today that, well, there was this historic Jesus and historic apostles, and then Gnosticism was like a later heresy. What Massey is saying is that's flipping it on its head. The Gnostic understanding was first. The literalizers had to come in and co-opt it and then claim that they were around first. But it's all based on myth. There was no literal, historical enactment on terrestrial soil of all these stories. They're all myth, and they can be shown to be celestial metaphor. So Massey is saying they claim that they were first and the Gnostic came later, but really the spiritual understanding was first, and the literalizers, the forgers, came in later. This is a very important argument to understand. So wrapping up Massey, this is the end of his lecture here. This is his conclusion. But there was a great gulf forever fixed between Gnostic Christology and historic Christianity. It was a gulf that never could be soundly bridged and never has been plumbed or bottomed or filled in. Nobody's even appreciated what a giant gulf there is until Massey is saying, look, I'm showing what a big divide there is. Across that gulf, the Christian church, the literalistic church, was erected upon supports on either side. On one side stood those pillars of the church which were seen by Paul in Jerusalem. In other words, the literalizers. On the other was Paul himself, the pillar that stood alone. A, different, a difference, the most radical and profound, divided him from the other apostles, Cephas, John, and James. From the first, they were on two sides of the chasm that could not be closed, and the Predicatio Petri declares that Peter and Paul remained unreconciled till death. The great work of the first centuries was how to bridge the chasm over, or at least how to conceal it from the eyes of the world in later times. They had to build a church and a bridge over that chasm and pretend it wasn't there. This could only be done by resting on Paul as a prop. They had to co-opt Paul as a prop and buttress on the one side and Peter on the other, which had to be done by converting or perverting the epistles of the Gnostic Paul into a support 
for historic Christianity. In that way, the church, the literalistic church, was founded. It was built as a bridge across the gulf, and the Pope of Rome appointed and aptly designated Pontifex Maximus. In other words, the great bridge builder. That's what pontiff means. The great bridge builder is bridging across from Paul and Peter and co-opting Paul and saying, oh, there's no gulf. There is no bottomless pit in between Paul and Peter. It was reared above the chasm, lying darkly, lurking like an open grave below. And today, as ever, the Christian world is horribly haunted with the fear that a breath or two of larger intellectual life, a too audible utterance of freer thought, a dose of mental dynamite, may bring the edifice of error down in wreck and ruin to fill that gulf at last, over which it was so perilously founded from the first. So Massey concludes there with this metaphor saying the gulf, it, this bottomless pit, is being bridged by this flimsy structure. And if people just start thinking, the whole flimsy structure should collapse down into that gulf because there is no reconciling the Gnostic or spiritual understanding with the literalistic understanding. They're teaching something totally divided. Massey's arguments are mostly negative here. I'm going to conclude by turning to the teaching of Alvin Boyd Kuhn. So Alvin Boyd Kuhn, if you've watched some of my other videos or some of my online courses, you know that I believe Alvin Boyd Kuhn is an extremely insightful teacher. He gives great credit to Massey. I believe he actually went in person to hear Massey speak and learn from Massey. That's what some biographers have written. You can see that Alvin Boyd Kuhn is basically a generation after Massey. So Massey was teaching, and Alvin Boyd Kuhn was learning from Massey. He gives great credit to Massey, but there's places where he has differences from Massey, and he points those out in his writings. Alvin Boyd Kuhn really gives, I would argue, the positive side of, of what Massey is talking about here. Let's take a look at some of Kuhn's writing just quickly as we close it out here from his masterpiece, Lost Light, which was published in 1940. Lost Light, this is from page 44 of Lost Light. I'm just going to quickly give you some quotations to see what is so important about this understanding that Paul was trying to teach and why this literalizing, this pursuing of an external, literalistic, external Jesus turns it on its head. That's what Massey was arguing. He's saying, look, Paul's teaching can never be uh, reconciled with the literalizers. Let's see what Alvin Boyd Kuhn says is so important about this. The spiritual internal Christ is because we have access to this internal divine spark. That's what Kuhn says this is all about. I'm just going to read this, these pages 44 through 47 are so important. You should read the whole thing. You can see them on the screen here. You can read all of Lost Light online. Let's conclude with what Alvin Boyd Kuhn says. The crux of the entire problem is the conception of deity, divinity, in a form perennially available for man in the heart of his own nature. This conception is the core of all religious theory, and loss of it has been the cause of doubt, confusion, and despair. So the entire issue here is understanding divinity in a form that's always available in our own heart, in our own nature. That's the key that all the different ancient wisdom of the world is trying to point you towards, according to 
Alvin Boyd Kuhn in Lost Light. And when we miss that, we fall into doubt, confusion, and despair. The boast of Christianity and Judaism, says Alvin Boyd Kuhn, is that they alone have presented to mankind its purest conception, its purest concept of deity in the form of the one God, monotheism. monotheism. The claim is by no means true as fact. They may more correctly be said to have been the first to present the one God without the ancient train of the subordinate gods. Okay, why is this important? We'll read on. As such, it turns out that the chalice of divinity that the church proffered to benighted nations as the supreme boon of religion was well nigh an empty cup because they taught the supreme ineffable divinity, which certainly exists, but without helping you understand that you grasp it through this internal gnosis that Paul was talking about. This is what Alvin Boyd Kuhn is going to argue here. We'll see it. Alvin Boyd Kuhn is criticizing historic literalism, saying, holding out a supreme ineffability to its followers, literalism withheld from them at the same time the knowledge of that deity that is lodged immediately within their own selfhood. Why? Because it's pointing them to a literal Jesus, an external Jesus, and therefore it's nullifying what Paul was teaching, a spiritual Christ. So they're holding out, hey, you have to know the ineffable, but you do that through an external historical Jesus, when Paul says, no, you get that through the divine spirit within the inner Christ, the internal Christ that Paul was talking about. Giving them a God who is, okay, so holding out a supreme ineffability to its followers, it withheld from them at the same time the knowledge of that deity that is lodged immediately within their own selfhood. It's saying, you don't have divinity within you. That's heresy to talk like that. You have to acknowledge the divinity of a literal external Jesus and deny access to the deity that is lodged immediately within, but that Paul was actually talking about, the Gnostic Paul. Giving them a God who is utterly inaccessible, it, literalism, blocked their approach to the God who was, quote, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. The one who's actually closer than your own hands and feet, because even closer than your breath, right there within your heart already, you have access to that. But they want you to look externally. And that's where the loss of the conception of deity in a form perennially available, that's what Kuhn is criticizing in literalism. Ancient religion, as in all the other ancient wisdom around the world, the pagan religion, the non-literal Christianity religion. Ancient religion was suspected of having left the monotheistic God out of its picture. It did not leave it out, but it had the discretion to leave it alone. The sage theologists reverenced it by a becoming silence. They don't talk about the ineffable. There is an ineffable divine God. But what you need to be focusing on is the accessible part of the divine that you have access to. That's what you're supposed to be learning, and that's what these myths, including all the stories in the Bible, are supposed to be pointing you towards. But, and that's what Paul, the Gnostic Paul, was teaching, but then the literalizers turned it into something else, something external. When you make it literal and historical, 
you automatically make it external. So, finishing up with Kuhn, but the pagan world provided a contact with a god dwelling immediately within the human breast. No reaching after the moon of the absolute diverted conscious purpose from actual touch with the god who stood at one's elbow. Don't go looking outside of yourself. The one that you have access to is standing right there at your elbow, immediately dwelling within the human breast, so close that you, you have access at all times, perennially. Deity for man is at home, not a field in distant skies. The kingdom of heaven and the hope of glory are within. They lurk within the unfathomed depths of consciousness. Divinity lies buried under the heavier motions of the sensual nature and the incessant scurrying of the superficial mind. That is such a beautiful sentence. Such a beautiful explanation that Alvin Boyd Kuhn is providing. And these are the teachings that Paul was teaching and that the literalizers were opposing. So we'll just finish off with Alvin Boyd Kuhn. You should read this whole, really this whole book, Lost Light, many, many times. But certainly these four pages are very powerful. So Alvin Boyd Kuhn says, Christianity has fervently exhorted us to look into the Empyrean to find the unapproachable God. All the while, the infant deity slumbers unheeded within the heart. Christianity has largely nullified the force of St. Paul's almost frantic cry to us. Know ye not your own selves how that Christ Jesus is within you? That's from 2 Corinthians 13.5. He's talking about an internal Christ, an internal deity. And so Alvin Boyd Kuhn says, Paul is trying to get this across to us. And he's horrified in his letters. He's saying, hey, how are you getting tricked into this literal external Jesus? Don't you know? Know you not that that Christ is within you. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your deeper divine self, your deeper infant deity that's sleeping right now, right there within your heart, unheeded. You're not paying attention to it because you're being told to look externally. But Paul frantically says, that Christ is in you. That's what you can call the higher self Christ, or you can call it Krishna, or you can understand it in all these different ways throughout the different myths of the world. So that is the conclusion of our examination today of this argument by Massey, Gerald Massey, in Paul, the Gnostic opponent of literalist Christianity, not the supporter of Christianity, literalist historic Christianity. He's the opponent of it. And why is it so important? Alvin Boyd Kuhn, who's coming after Gerald Massey and saying, hey, Massey was great, but he missed a few things. Let me just really bring it home. I think that really brings it home. How important it is to understand this argument that Massey is laying out. And how important it is for world history, this overthrowing and subverting of the ancient wisdom by this deceptive and aggressive literalist hierarchy that came in and subverted the teachings that were going around in all these different letters some of them attributed to Paul, other Gnostic texts that we've found. That was an expression of one form of the ancient wisdom. The stories in the Bible can be shown to be related to the stories around the world. And then this literalist, hierarchical, 
and trauma-inducing teaching eternal damnation if you don't believe in an external, literal Jesus, teaching eternal damnation if you don't accept the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Massey refers to this threat of eternal damnation a few times. The ancient wisdom around the world points towards the recovery of self, that higher self through which we have access to the divine, to the divine realm, to divine inspiration. We get that through that deeper self that Paul was talking about in those letters. And that recovery of self points towards healing of trauma. That's what the ancient wisdom has as one of its central themes, recovery of self, healing of trauma. And we can demonstrate that around the world, in the myths around the world, and in the stories of the Bible. But this literalist, deceitful, hierarchical, and trauma-inducing system came in and turned all of that on its head. So Massey paints this divide as starkly as anybody and as clearly as anybody. Like I said, I don't agree with every single thing or every single argument that Massey ever wrote. But I do agree that this is a very important subject that he is articulating here, and I agree with his thesis that what Paul or these letters attributed to Paul are teaching is something completely different from literalist historic Christianity that has tried to co-opt Paul deceptively into being a support for their unnatural trauma-inducing system. And Massey shows there is just no commonality between literalist historic Christianity and these spiritual esoteric teachings about an internal Christ that the letters attributed to Paul are articulating. It's such an important argument for us to understand because this is such a critical period of history. The rise of literalist Christianity impacted everything for the following 17, 18 centuries right up to today. But we can show that the scriptures the stories, the figures in the Bible are based on the stars that shows that they're esoteric, that shows that they're metaphorical, that shows that they're not terrestrial, literal, and historical, and that shows that they are talking about something else. And I agree with Massey's argument, and I agree with the interpretation that Paul was talking about an internal landscape, an internal Christ, an internal higher self. That's another higher self figure, just like we find around the world. So it's so important to understand. Thank you so much for listening.